It is not some you know, tale passed down from generations and whatnot that has been changed and corrupted. No, this really happened. It's history. There really was Mary. There really was Joseph. There really were wise men. Amen? Bethlehem was and is a very real place. When we talked about Book of Revelation, seven churches, I tried to make the point that these were real people and real places. To me, that brings the Scripture alive when you realize that we're not just talking about cardboard flannel graph figures here. We're talking about real people. And the Christmas story is real. It's about fulfilled prophecies. It's about the love of God for our planet, for each one of us. It's about a God who keeps his word. In fact, this, this Christmas, I want to make a um, topic of hope as the theme. And I want to look at the words God spoke to bring hope to all of us through the Christmas story. Because, you know, we've all probably hear or heard the story many times, you know. But let's look at the words that were spoken throughout this story, and let's grab hope out of it. Because I think, as I survey the land, I think we need hope. I'll let you say amen to that. There are so many folks who feel hopeless. They feel disenfranchised and angry. There are a lot of folks who have a chip on their shoulder. And uh, there are even some who feel that uh, the world is in a hopeless place. Well, you know, I'm from North Dakota, and we're hopeful people. And I believe there's still hope for the world. And I believe this Christmas story, when we look at it correctly, when we look at it the way Scripture teaches it, when we look at the history of the real people involved, we can find words of hope. And I think we can rally around the Christmas story. There's so much division, uh, maybe not so much in our church, but in many of the churches, of people who are just not of one mind anymore. Some folks are on one side of the spectrum, others on the other side of the spectrum, and it's kind of bubbling under the surface. You know, it's kind of like a, you, when you get together for Thanksgiving, you say, don't talk politics with Uncle Al. You know, it, you know, there's just this thing kind of going on. And I'm wondering if we couldn't all find some agreement and some unity about the Christmas story as we gather around that hope that we find in it. Because there really is a story about hope especially if you really look at it closely. It's about hope. Here's a quote to get us started. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epoch of belief. It was the epoch of incredulity. It was the season of light and the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope. It was the winter of despair. We had everything before us. We had nothing before us. We were all going directly to heaven. We were all going directly the other way. So began Charles Dickens' The Tale of Two Cities. And I, I don't know, it just seems like that rings true to me today, that we definitely see that kind of thing going on around us today. And I think that we are hungry for good news, for Christian Christmas hope. Somebody say amen. Now turn to your neighbor and say, I could use a little hope. Friends at home, turn to your neighbor and say, hey, we could use a little hope. Absolutely. And of course, when we talk about hope, we're talking about Christmas the way God wants us to celebrate it. Not the way it is being uh, corrupted and changed by the world around us. You know, did you know that there are, psychologists have studied the emotional stress level of people? And they have found that the most emotionally stressful season of the year is the one we just entered into. That folks just stress out during Christmas between uh, the, you know, the gift giving and the purchasing. And of course, the weather gets bad. On top of that is the preparations for family or for travel. And the, the expectations are just so high that there's so much anxiety for some people that they basically just kind of drink it away. During Christmas. 
because there's a lot of anxiety going on right now. And expectations are so high. You know what I hate most about Christmas? Can I just be transparent with you now? Can I? Is it okay, Ace? I'll be transparent. I hate those Hallmark Christmas movies. <laughs> oh, God. Three trees for Christmas hope. Sarah finds a Christmas kiss. A Christmas sewer district holiday. I mean, they just go on and on. You know, a NASCAR Christmas. Christmas at Big Bear. I mean, I'm just like, what in the world? And they have like a thousand of them. There are stations that just play Christmas movies round the clock. And it's amazing how those movies, I can write the script. Okay, right? Okay, here you go. Here's the script. Okay, ready? Ready? Here we go. Chuck, you ready? Okay, you have a woman whose husband dies of a terrible plague. She has three kids. In order to start a new life, they move to a new city. When they get to the city, they find nobody likes them because they're different. And then when they get to the city, they find a strange but attractive man running a rundown grocery store. Looking for a job, she goes to work at the grocery store. And sparks start to fly. And it looks like they're going to be married. But then his ex-wife appears. And all of a sudden, there is doubt. Will they get married? Well, on Christmas Eve, he finds her and says, will you marry me? As Santa Claus flies back in the distance. Raise the music. Do the next one. Hallmark, Hallmark Christmas service, you know. Yeah, you saw that last night, yeah. Expectations are so high for Christmas. I'm not looking for a Hallmark Christmas. I got no expectations in those things at all. But I do know that Jesus is going to visit us. And over the next few weeks, as we study together this story, we're going to find hope that's based not in Hallmark, but in God, in the true story. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we pray as we enter into this Christmas season, as we begin a new series of Christmas sermons, God, that hope will burst upon us a hope based in truth and reality and the love of God, not a hope that's based in false expectations or secular things, but a hope found in the Word of God. Help us, Lord, to see this with fresh eyes and renewed hearts. And Lord, we're asking this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So turn your Bibles to Luke chapter 1, 26 through 38. Luke Chapter 1, 26 through 38. And today I want to talk about uh, Mary and Joseph and bring some insight into those two. But Luke 1, starting with verse 26. Again, a familiar story, but let's try to hear it with new ears. What do you say? Let's just try not to zone out, but actually listen again, like maybe it was the first time you'd heard it, okay? So Luke 1, 26. Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. To a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, for the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. But when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. For you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth the Son and shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. Then Mary said to the angel, How can this be since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also, that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. 
For with God, nothing will be impossible. Then Mary said, Behold, the maid servant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. Let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. And the angel departed from her. So what, what do we know about, about Mary? Let's just get a little historical background here and understand. Okay, So we know Mary was from the town of Nazareth. Now, it's interesting that the first century town of Nazareth was famous for just one thing. It was famous for its sin. Now, a lot of people don't know that about Nazareth. You see, it was located just four miles from a Roman garrison at Sephora. I think we have a map. Um, there's the map. There's Nazareth. It doesn't show Sephora, but Sephora would be up there towards the top, four miles from Nazareth. And this was a Roman garrison. And when the uh, Roman soldiers would get a little extra money or they'd get a bonus or they would get some leave, uh, they would uh, leave that garrison and they'd head to Nazareth where they would find lots of wine and uh, lots of women of the kind that you know I'm speaking. And it, so Nazareth was really well known for its red light district and it was a place known for its sin. And that helps us understand the comment made about Jesus when the, the comment was made, can anything good come from Nazareth? Well, that's why. Because it was thought of as a sinful, red light kind of place to go. And so, uh, you know, it speaks to us so highly of how God can move in a messy and sinful place. Because if you think about it, maybe you'd say, well, maybe God would choose a woman from the temple. Or maybe he, he would choose somebody from a more righteous kind of place. But instead, he chose Mary from this place uh, called Nazareth. And could we also bring up this comment? Think about this. That in a town known for its sin and its depravity, as Nazareth was in the first century, we find a, a virtuous virgin gal named Mary living that kind of life in that kind of environment. It speaks again to the kind of woman she must have been to be able to do that in Nazareth. Now, God speaks to uh, her through Gabriel the angel, and uh, she is already engaged at this time. Now, it's interesting about engagement. Let me just share with you some of the background of what engagement and marriage was, how it was done in the first century. It's not the same as we do here in America, not by a long, long shot at all. In fact, she was probably uh, only 13 or 14 years old. She could have been even younger than that, but most likely somewhere around 13 or 14 years old, and she would have been uh, living with her parents. Uh, this was how it was done. And I'm going to talk in a minute about the difference between betrothal and engagement because it's, it's a significant thing. But it's interesting that God chose her uh, at age 13 or 14, living with her parents, and it says uh, it was not because of anything special other than her being a godly young woman about Mary. Now, the Catholics have a, a doctrine called the Immaculate Conception. And maybe you have heard of that. And I hope I won't offend any of our Catholic friends watching. But the Immaculate Conception is misunderstood by Protestants. See, we think it's referring to Jesus' conception. But in the Catholic Church, the doctrine of immaculate conception refers to the idea or the, or the notion that Mary was born without sin. And the fact is that she was just like you or me. She wasn't born immaculately. She was born just like you or me, with the same temptations and issues you or I would have. She was walking with God in a beautiful way, but she wasn't without sins. So you say amen to that. I say that just because I want to be sure you have the truth about this gal. In fact, it says that she was favored one, the favored one. That means covered in grace, the one filled with grace, covered in grace. And that speaks to the fact that she needed grace, that she wasn't perfect in every way. Now, as she was listening to the angel, imagine yourself as you're 13, 14 years old, you know, living with your parents, you have been uh, betrothed to this man, and this angel says to you, you are going to have 
a baby. What do you suppose would go through your mind? 13 or 14 years old. Well, the first thing you might think about is, of course, how could this happen, right? You're saying, how could I possibly? I mean, they knew the birds and the bees, amen? They knew that. And she's like, how could that happen? But after that, there'd be a whole bunch of other things that would come to her mind. For example, to be pregnant out of wedlock was a very shameful thing in those days. And so it would have been a ter terrible shame, not just upon her, but upon her family, upon her relatives. These are small towns. People know. People talk. And, and it would have been a very shameful thing. It she would have had to carry that all her life, of being pregnant out of wedlock. She would have been under a cloud of sus suspicion all her life. And that's what's so interesting. When Mary says, let it be done to your servant. What a step of faith and obedience. Because she knew what it meant to be pregnant before being married. And yet she was willing to walk in faith and trust the Lord that this was going to, you know, this would work out. And so she says, let this be done. Now, I personally think, this is only an opinion of mine. You could disagree. But I think she could have said no. I just think our God gives us choices. You know, and I think she could have said, no, God, not me. I'm not the one. But, of course, she didn't. She received that. She was willing to do it. It could have been a prescription for a very, very lonely future. Now, again, she knew that Joseph was in the picture, but in her thinking, maybe Joseph drops her like a hot potato, amen? Forget the wedding. Family shuns her. Town shuns her. What, does she end up a single mom living outside of town someplace? That's what could have flashed through her mind. That's why it's so interesting how God tells her about Elizabeth. And I like to think God was saying that to her as a kind of an amen. If I can do this with Elizabeth, I can do it for you. It's going to be okay, Mary. It's going to be all right. It's interesting how Mary then responds with prophetic words. I said I want to talk about the words that were spoken. So in your scriptures, starting with chapter 1, verse 46, Mary actually has a spirit of prophecy come upon her, and she speaks a prophetic word in response to this. Chapter 1, verse 46 through 55, it says this. Mary said, my soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. For he has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. His mercy is on those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He has put down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He has filled the hungry with good things. The rich he sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seeds forever. So we look at that and, and we learn something more about Mary. The first thing we learn is this, that she was a very humble person. She says, God, my Savior. She understood. She needed a Savior, just like you or me. That's a funny thought, isn't it? Because I know, again, some folks have elevated Mary so high that even the thought that Mary might need a Savior. But she did. She needed a Savior just like you and I needed a Savior. And that this God would be the one who would save her. In a minute, we're going to have a song called Mary, Did You Know? And the question is, did, did Mary know that the baby she was going to carry would be her Savior one day? It's a fabulous thought to just, just think on that a little bit. So interesting that this same baby would be the one who would bring forgiveness to us all if we're humble enough to receive that forgiveness. We live in a world that wants to be self-sufficient. It's a do-it-yourself world. If you don't believe me, go to home base. Just look around that place, and you'll see all the do-it-yourselfers. Everybody wants to do it themselves. But there's one thing you can't do for yourself. 
You cannot forgive your sins. Only God can forgive your sins. And we all need forgiveness. Okay, quick poll. Are you ready? Quick poll. Ready, Paul? Here we go. Quick poll. Everybody who's sinless, raise your hand. I'm looking. Nobody. We all need forgiveness. Even Mary needed forgiveness. You know what? Here's the thing. You've got to be able to receive it. There's so much independent spirit, pridefulness. To admit to God and to yourself, I am a sinner. I need forgiveness. I'm not perfect. It's a big jump for some folks. But that's exactly what Mary was able to do. Second thing, Mary was a worshiper. If you look carefully at what she said, she is worshiping the Lord. She is saying he's holy, he's mighty, he's merciful, he's strong. Mary was a worshiper. Listen, I don't think that just fell upon her for the first time right there. I think she was a worshiper all of her life. I think she lived her life as a worshiper. It was natural for her to worship when this whole thing was happening to her. And you know what worship does, church? Worship reminds us, get this now, worship reminds us that we are not the center of the universe. Contrary to popular opinion, you are not the center of the universe. Neither am I. Amen? And when we worship, we get ourselves back in the right place. He is mighty. Amen? He is holy. Amen? He is strong. Not us. Not us at all. Number three, Mary was able to receive help from a God who loves to help. She could receive help. She admitted she needs help. And again, that speaks to, especially those of us up here in the Pacific Northwest, you know, our forebearers were rugged individualists. They came up here and carved out uh, cities and, uh, from trees and forests and Indians and that's our forebears, rugged individualists who didn't like to admit they needed help and wouldn't want to receive help. But here's the thing. You've got to be able to receive God's help. And Mary could do that. Okay, let's take a few minutes and let's look at Joseph. I wish we had more information about Joseph. Joseph is an interesting dude. I mean, we all kind of wish we had more to look at about Joseph. Uh, we do know, the gospel says that Joseph was a righteous man. We do know that, that meant he would have kept the Jewish law. He was a devout man, cared about God, loved God. Uh, he was a righteous man. It also says he worked as a carpenter. And uh, what we know about first century carpenters is they would plan and build homes. They would manufacture furniture and make farming tools. So he was a guy who was handy with his hands. Say amen to that. He was probably a guy in demand. Towns would love to have a guy like Joseph set up shop in their, in their city or their town. Uh, but to think of him as, as poor as a pauper is probably wrong. Are you guys got me? I mean, he, he was not a wealthy man, but he was not a poor man. He was a business owner, a small business owner. And if any of you guys are that or know that, that means there are times of feast and famine. There are times you got lots of money, and other times you got no money. And you know what it means to have to keep the books and pay the taxes and do all those things. So this guy was not dumb. Okay? Capable, smart man. He knew the ways of the world. And I mean that in the way of a businessman would. Anybody here ever worked with or for in the building industry? You know you got to have a little bit on the ball to thrive, amen? That was Joseph, self-employed man. Now, historically, we know this. Hang in there now. Historically, we know that if he was about to take a bride, he was probably about 25 years old. That was the age at which businessmen would often take their first bride. And how old was she? Something around 13. He's 25. Wow, that's almost twice her age. Amen? You see what so she was very young. Now, of course, 25 isn't elderly by any means. I would love a shot at 25 again. But, but he wasn't necessarily a teenager, okay? 
And so how this would work in those days, just listen, this is the marriage custom in those days, okay? So Joseph would have decided he could take a wife. He had enough money. He had his place to live. You know, his, he had his ducks lined up in a row. And so he would go to um, his parents first. And he'd say, hey, Mom and Dad, I'm, I'm thinking of marrying this gal I saw there, this Mary. And uh, what do you guys think? And his mom and dad would first would have to say, yeah, that sounds like a good match for us. I always find that funny. Because I don't know that too many of our kids would ask us for our permission anymore. But they did in those days. And so he would have gone to his parents and asked about this Mary. And they would have talked about her lineage, her family lines. They would have talked about her financial place. They had talked about her reputation. What, you know, they would have gone through all In fact, it was almost like a business contract. They would sit down and say, okay, Mary's got this, 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 this. Check the boxes, you know, and you got this. Check the boxes. And they'd try to come to deciding, well, would it be a good match? Uh, the writers from those days talk about how very little was mentioned about loving one another. And the fact was, they probably barely knew each other. But, you know, caught, caught his eye, you know. And so they'd go down, and they would decide if they were a good match. Notice who was making this decision? Parents with Joseph's input, but a lot to do with the parents. Boy, I wish I could pick my, my kids as a... What do you say here, Denise? We'll line them up for our kids. What do you say? It wouldn't go over very big, would it, guys? But in those days, that's how it was done. So what would have happened then uh, is Joseph's father, having decided this was a good match, Joseph's father... Uh, probably not the mom, but the father, would have gone to Mary's family. And they would have had a, a meeting and, you know, had a meal, and they'd have talked about uh, my son Joseph, who is a carpenter. He's got X amount of money in the bank. He's got a house. You know, he owns a donkey, blah, blah, blah. He would like very much to uh, marry your daughter, Mary. And so then they would talk about it, whether or not her parents think it's a good idea to marry Joseph. And Mary probably would have been in the next room or out the window listening and go, oh, oh, boy, you know, is it going to work? What's going to happen? And after deciding it was a good match, then the two families, uh, not the kids, but the moms and dads, would have taken a cup of wine and shared one cup of wine together, and it was the symbol of a covenant. It was saying, we have made a contract, a covenant. Joseph and Mary are going to get married. This was called betrothal. See, we don't have that in our American romantic life, I guess you'd say. So at that point, they were legally betrothed, Mary and Joseph, even if they barely knew each other. Now, who knows how much they knew each other? They may have known each other very well, but maybe not. But they were betrothed, and that meant that if he died in the next roughly year to the wedding, if he died, she was his widow. Okay, and got whatever legal things were part of that. And if she somehow broke the wedding, the betrothal, then it would be a divorce on both of them. So this betrothal thing was a serious step in this whole kind of thing. So uh, they, would, they would then maintain their virginity for about the next year, and, and they would plan the wedding day and, uh, of course, have the big wedding celebration. And now it's very interesting uh, during this betrothal time that that's when Mary would have come to Joseph and would have, after seeing Elizabeth, would have come back and probably said, you know, I got to talk to Joseph. I got to because I'm going to start showing pretty soon. And I don't want him to hear the wrong way. So she would have had to set up a time with Joseph. And he, she would have to tell him, Joseph, I'm pregnant. Now, if you were Joseph, what would have gone through your mind? I mean, she would have followed that up with probably, hey, I met this angel. You know, the angel told me I've been faithful. I have not had sex with any men. This is a God baby. Can you know, imagine how Joseph would respond to her saying, this is a baby born of God? Come on, guys. What would you have thought? <laughs> yeah. But that's what the conversation would have been. That's how it would have had it gone. 
And, of course, Joseph would know that his conscience was clear. He says, it's not my baby. I know that much. But what happened when he went and saw Elizabeth? Or, or what happened, you know? But we do know this, that Joseph was a godly man, and he wanted to do the right thing. Now, listen, legally, culturally, he could have called her an adulteress and ended it with a divorce. He could have said, you're leave town, it's done. She could have had to leave town, have babies. Remember, there were times in America where people were sent out of town to have babies. Could have done the same kind of thing. So he had three options. He could have married her right away. Could have cut through the red tape, you know, gone to Vegas. Just married her, just right then and there. And that would have saved her uh, you know, the embarrassment, although thinking minds might have done some math and figured something out, but still he could have done that. He could have divorced her publicly, brought shame on her and the family out of just anger and spite. I mean, he, he could have done that. Uh, or he could have just said, the betrothal's off. Mary, you should leave town. You know, see you later. That's how it goes. So as he's trying to decide what to do, and this was not an easy decision. Most of these did not work out well for her, obviously. God speaks to him with words of hope, just as he did to Joseph. In the book of Matthew, chapter 1, we have what happened uh, with Joseph. And let's look at that, because as we had God speaking words of hope through Mary, and she wondered what about this whole thing, God speaks to Joseph as well as he gets this divine guidance. Matthew 1 and 18. It says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as followed. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with a child of the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a just man, not one to make her a public example, was minded to put her away secretly. But while he thought about these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. St. Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take to you Mary, your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And she will bring forth a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Joseph, being aroused from his sleep, did as the angel commanded him and took to him his wife and did not know her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. So God speaks to Joseph through an angel and tells him to do the difficult thing, to go ahead and, and take her as, as his wife, to trust the Lord that this was going to work out, that this was his plan. And I hope you can understand from this, the little bit I've shared, what tremendous step of faith and trust this was, especially for Joseph. Remember, he only took one bride, right? And this was a big deal for him. And yet he obeyed what the angel said, and he took this pregnant gal to be his bride. And this was a fulfillment of, of prophecy that the virgin would bear a son. You think about that. Can Joseph have said no? What do you think? I think he probably could have. He could have said no, just like Mary could have said no. But they both walked with God and trusted God. And having had this encounter with God, they obeyed and followed. I would like to think, that each one of us, if we had an encounter with an angel <laughs> like that, we would obey. How about you? I'd like to think we would. I'd like to think that would touch us in such a way that we could go against cultural norms, go against what we knew about biology, that we could go against family expectations and obey the Lord our God, even if it was a step of faith, which is what it was for these two young people. Just a couple things, and then it's time for our video. We're going to close. As a takeaway, I thought about this. There's a lot here. But I thought in regards to Mary, 
Remember God, through the angel, said that she was the favored one, the grace-covered one, the grace-filled one. You know what? All of us are people of grace. All of us are covered in grace. All of us are people that God has grace for in our lives. And I would just want to remind you, you know what? Give yourself a break this Christmas. Hello? Give yourself a break. Have a little grace. You know what? For all you perfectionists out there, it's okay if the Christmas tree isn't perfect this year. It's okay to have grace for your family, grace for that weird Uncle Al. You know, grace in our families. As Mary was the favored one, you're a favored one through Jesus Christ our Lord. For Joseph, I think we can understand and, and receive that God wants to guide us in our lives, that he wants to direct our paths and teach us the way to go. It's up to us to be obedient and follow those paths. Of course, that's the hard part, isn't it? But God wants to speak to us and guide us in the way we can go. A few, few years back, a um, member of the Gaither vocal band, I know that's kind of an old, stodgy thing, but he wrote a beautiful song called Mary, Did You Know? For a lot of you, it's probably your favorite Christmas song. And it, it brings up that question. Mary is carrying her own Savior, the one who would die for her. She's giving life to the one who would give life to her. It's, a, it's just a wonderful thing. And so I thought a good way to change our service, or to close our service today, would be to, to hear the song, to enjoy the song, uh, and then uh, Kara is going to come and close our service with a blessing. So why don't we go ahead and do it? We'll bring the lights down, and we'll enjoy uh, Mark Lowry. All right, why don't you go ahead and stand? It has been a good day in God's house, and why don't you get a stretch in? I'm just going to pray a blessing over you right before we leave here. Remember, we have a couple of Christmas events that are happening, so make sure you mark your calendars for our Christmas party, and we have food bank this week, and we have... Um, our Wednesday night class is at 7 on Wednesday. And so um, make sure you're there for that. And are you ready to receive a blessing? All right. Lord God, I just pray that you will strengthen and encourage each person here, that you will give each one of us the grace and peace and hope and joy that comes only from you, and that you will be able to bless us for this week ahead, Lord, and that we will be able to do your work and, and give others great hope and joy and peace in this time of year, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. All right. Have a great Sunday, and we'll see you this week.